Are you glad to be at church today? All right, all right. Well, let me uh, give a couple quick shout outs here. My wife and I were just on vacation for two weeks. Come on, somebody with a two week vacation. This is as tan as I get, and I know it's not that tan, all right? You don't got to come to Guest Central and say, you don't look tan. I know, okay? Uh, it, I just have a red hue, and then it just drifts away. Uh, it was like it was never here, but we had a great time. I want to thank Pastor Jeff and Pastor Brian for delivering a good word while I was gone. We watched both. It's a good deal when the pastor skips town and you have two world-class sermons that are provided. So thank you so much to them. Uh, I also just want to give a quick shout out to our new worship pastor, Pastor Brandon Estelle. Have you enjoyed him? Yes, absolutely. The first time that he was here, I had to introduce him to you as my buddy Brandon, right? And, uh, and I really enjoyed getting to know him and just so grateful that God has provided him to this church. I just, uh, you can tell he's a gifted guy, right? And his wife's gifted. What an what a awesome privilege it is to be led by them. But I just want you to know he's also a really good leader and a great pastor. And so you're going to enjoy getting to know him. I really honestly feel like this is the best church in the world, and I want you to have the best leaders in the world. And so we're grateful that God has provided him to us, and uh, looking forward for you getting to know him. Let me give a shout out to, if you're watching online, we're glad that you're connecting with us. Let us know how we can pray or help. We are uh, in week three of our series called Ancestors. We're going to look today at Abraham and Sarah. I haven't preached for three weeks. Come on, somebody. This could be, I cannot be held responsible for what comes out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> but I'm excited, and so I'm going to have you stand up. We're going to read God's Word together to get into it, and, uh, and then I'm going to pray for us, and we will get rolling. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 begins in this way, therefore, and any time that you're reading through God's Word and it says, therefore, you should ask yourself, what's this therefore? And what it's there for is that before Hebrews chapter 12 is Hebrews chapter 11. That was a little better than the first service. Uh, but the Hebrews chapter 11 is that chapter that's called the Hall of Faith. or the, 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 These are all these enormous saints who have gone before us. And, and the Bible says that now that you've seen their story and their faith and God's work in them, because of that, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let me say it to you this way, you got a cheering section up in heaven right now. you got saints of old who God has both saved and worked in and brought home who are looking down at Kansas City and saying, come on, Graceway, heaven and hell are real. We're, we're in one. Make, make this place bigger. Make much of Jesus. Bring God glory. Do what he's called you to do. We're surrounded by those stories because of that. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance. That's the word we're going to talk about today through the life of Sarah. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. This word endurance shows up in the life of Abraham and Sarah in really a unique way. And I'm going to spend some time talking to you today about the life of Sarah. And here's how I want you to understand this word in the context of faith. It's when I'm very clear on what God has promised, who God is, what God says he's going to do, but I'm worn out waiting. Have you been there? That you're waiting on God to do what he said he was going to do. You're waiting on God to show up. You're waiting on God to speak. You're waiting on God to provide. That is what the life of Sarah, as we understand it, is all about. And so I think God has a word for you today. Let me talk to him before we go any further. God, I come to you on behalf of my friends, my brothers and sisters who have walked in the door today. And God, we, we want to see you work. We want to hear your voice. We believe that you're powerful and that you're good and that you're kind. God, we believe intellectually the promises of who you say that you are and who you say that I am. But God, the truth is that there is some endurance in the waiting. There is some endurance in the lack. There is some endurance in faith as it drifts, in hope as it drifts, in fear as it comes. And through the life of Sarah, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would encourage our hearts, that you would be near to us, that you would speak to us anew, direct us anew, provide for us anew. Let us know that you haven't lost us. Let us know that you see us and that you're at work and that your promises still stand. God, I pray that you would have your way in this place, grace, way today. For your glory and our joy, all God's people said, Amen and amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. 
Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to go back and look at the story of Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is probably 65 or 70 years old. He's lived the same place his entire life. He's built a life for himself. He has all the relationships that he could want, everything he could possibly need. And God comes to him and says, I've got something awesome for you, man. I'm going to do something that's going to blow your mind. And Abraham says, sweet, give it to me. And he says, in order for you to get it, you got to leave here and you got to go there. And Abraham says, go where? And God says, I'm only going to tell you once you obey me and you get moving. You have to understand that sometimes the blessings of God only follow in our obedience to God. Not always. Sometimes God just in his grace gives mercy. Sometimes in his grace God gives provision. But in Abraham's life, God said, the great thing that I have for you is over there. And what does the Bible say? That Abraham obeyed and that he went. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in the foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The book of Romans describes it this way, Romans 4 and verse 18. It says that in hope he believed against hope. I love that phrase. This is believing God when it's not logical to believe God. This is believing God when it's actually impractical to believe God. Maybe you've been in that spot. Man, I wish that there was a different way, but God says this is the way, and so I'm going to trust this, even though it seems like it would be easier and better and quicker and more expedient if I did it this way. I'm going to hope against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. God takes Abraham out into a field. He says, Abe, here's the deal, man. I'm going to make you the father of of many nations. Abraham says, what does that mean? He says, I want you to look up into the sky and I want you to start counting stars. And so Abraham starts one, two, three, four, seven, 19, 19. He just eventually runs out. He's like, dude, it's not possible for me to have this many kids because my wife, Sarah, is what? She's barren, right? She's barren and she's old. She's got a wrinkly womb. Come on, somebody. Like it ain't going to work anymore. She's past that time where she's going to be able to provide me with one kid, let alone all these kids. It doesn't make any sense. And, and, and why have you waited this long? And why is it taking so long? And why is this so hard? And I'm getting worn out. The Bible says that Abraham believed against hope. He had hope when it didn't have any, make any sense to have hope. And here's the thing that I need you to understand about Abraham. Abraham believed something that was really going to be experienced by somebody else right? And I need to tell you this about faith. This isn't where we're going to hang out the most, but it's important for you to understand that sometimes you're going to have to borrow somebody else's faith to step into what God has for you. Sometimes you're going to have to say, man, I'm trusting God. I believe that God has this thing for me, but I just don't have the strength, the courage to step into it. And you're going to have to have somebody who's beside you who says, I believe it. And they kind of give you a little bit of nudge. This is the reason that I want you to be in groups. Okay? This is the reason that I want you to be in groups because I know that there are times that the thing that God has for you, no matter how much your heart says I want it, you just can't kind of muster up the strength to trust him. And you need someone who says, I believe what God has. And you can borrow their faith to take that step. There are other times where your obedience and your belief is the thing that's going to let somebody else take that step. Sometimes you're on the receiving end and sometimes you're on the providing end. That you say, I see something in you that you don't see for you. I see that God has something for you that you can't see for you. And I'm going to believe enough for both of us. Abraham believed for Sarah. Right? Abraham believed, yes, I do believe, however it's going to happen, that you're going to make my wife pregnant. And I want you to imagine if Abraham didn't believe how it would have affected Sarah. If, if God came to Sarah and said, hey, sis, I got this incredible plan for you. I'm going to make you pregnant. And in the background, Abe's like, <laughs> pregnant, come on. What, what, if, what if Abraham hadn't set the stage for Sarah to be able to believe? What if Abraham hadn't gone first? I imagine that it would have been an incredibly painful, more painful struggle for Sarah to try to enter into faith. But what we know is that eventually Sarah couldn't borrow Abraham's faith any longer. And let me tell you the same. If you're in here today and you're raised in a Christian home, eventually that faith's got to become yours. You can't just live on mom's faith. You can't just live on dad's prayer life. You can't just live on who they think God is. You've got to figure out who God is to you. 
And the same thing is true with Abraham. Eventually, Sarah had to say, okay, I've got enough of a nudge. I'm going to trust and I'm going to believe. And the book of Hebrews says it this way, by faith, Sarah herself, herself, not because of Abraham, received power to conceive. And I want you to look at the power of faith. By faith, she received power to have a baby when she shouldn't have been able to have a baby. That's the strength. That's the power that is available to us through the resurrected Jesus. Jesus Christ, even when she was past the age, since she considered him, that being God, faithful who had promised. Faithful who had promised. And so here's what I want to do. I want you to imagine that this is just the introduction. And I want you to imagine that Sarah is sitting down on this front row, and I say, all right, sis, come on, come up here, and tell us what it was in your journey to learn to live endurance, to learn to live by faith, to learn to hope against hope. And I just want to give you four things today that I think are going to be helpful that I imagine that she would have said to us if she had had the opportunity to communicate with us. And I think the first one is this. I think she would have stood up and said, hey, listen, don't, don't complicate the promises of God. Don't complicate the promises of God. And I think that she would have said something like this. And baby, most of the time, the thing that complicates the promises of God is the solutions you come up with. Most of the time, the thing that gets in the way of the promises of God isn't the promises of God, the power of God, the insistence and persistence of God. It's you and it's me who say, this is taking too long. I, I think God lost me. And I imagine that Sarah would have said, here's the truth of it. I heard what God said. I just didn't think he was going to get it done. I just didn't think that he was going to follow through. I mean, maybe he wrote himself in post-it note or something like that. Maybe, I don't know what happened. But there came a point when I felt like if I didn't step in, it wasn't going to happen. Have you been there? Have you been there? Where you've thought to yourself, if I don't grab this thing, it isn't, it isn't going to happen. I know what I need. I'm just going to come up with a solution. I imagine that Sarah would have started out by saying, you're going to complicate the simplicity of the power of God in your life if you don't take him simply at his word. You don't take him simply at his word. And so she would have said something like this, as I want you to believe the promises of God even when it takes a long time. Even when it takes a long time. And I want to be a good pastor to you, and I want to be helpful to you. This is kind of a hard word, but let me just say to you, it almost always takes a long time. Are you out there? Only for me? Maybe this whole time I was thinking I was the only one. It almost always takes a long time. Amen? Yeah. And I think this is one of our least favorite things about God. That sometimes we feel like God says something to us, wants to provide something for us, and it's like, whenever you're ready, man. There's a guy who has an opportunity to talk to God, and he says, God, on this time thing, like, what's a million years like for you? And God says, oh, that's like a second for me. Wow, that's crazy. Well, like, what's a million dollars for you? And God's like, a million bucks is like a penny for me. And the guy goes, can I get one of them pennies? And God says, sure you can, in a second. That's funny. I don't care what y'all say, all right? Yeah, sure, you can get, you can get a million bucks in a second. Look at, look at what happened with Sarah. The Bible says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And I, don't, I want you to read God's word as though these were living people who struggled just like you and I did. This is a woman who wants kids and she can't have them. This is a woman who's grieving. This is a woman when she goes to the grocery store and she sees moms with cartfuls of kids. You know what I'm talking about? God, you said you were going to give me a kid. What's the deal? And she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. When you're struggling to believe God, even when it takes a long time, it messes up your theology. Was this true? It wasn't true. It was just taking too long. And when you begin to struggle, failing to believe, prone to complicate the promises of God, it sometimes will change your theology. That's what happened to Sarah. And she says, Go into my servant. And it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And yes, that means what you think it means. And Abram was not in a group. Because if he was in a group, he would have, somebody would have said, don't you ever. <laughs> like, you must be outside of your mind. And this is a guy who hadn't gone through grow track and wasn't in a group, and look what happened. I'm just saying. All right? I'm trying to help you. <laughs> 
He's like, okay. And he goes in, and he's intimate with Sarah's servant, and his, her servant gives birth to a son whose name is Ishmael. Listen, her theology gets jacked up, and listen to this. Ishmael is the father of all Arab people groups. Have you watched the news lately? Have you watched how the Hebrew people and all other Arab people, how they talk about one another and how they feel about one another? This is where that started. Somebody who, who complicated, and I imagine that Sarah probably would get a little misty and be like, if I had known that it was going to cost that much, I would have waited. I would have waited. She would have said, believe, believe the promises of God, even when it's unbelievable. And can I just tell you, uh, you're going to have to get used to it being unbelievable. I, I want to I wanna pastor you. You're going to have to get used to the reality that God will mess up your normal. Because God doesn't operate according to my normal. Do you know how I know this? Because I, this is how I got into this Christian thing. The Bible says that God loved the world that wasn't just kind of neutral. We were against him. We were his enemy. We were sinners. That he loved his enemies. That he sent his only son to the world to be butchered by his enemies because he loved them so much. That he does for us what we can't do for ourselves. And that the only way that we lose it is, is if we insist on earning it. That's grace. That's not logical. Why would God do that? Because God doesn't operate like you and I operate. Do you know that whenever we're talking about our enemies, God doesn't say, uh, hey, kill your enemies. Hey, hate your enemies. What's he say? Love your enemies. God says that it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Okay, let, me, let me just push a little bit further. Do you know that there's a way that God says that he's to be worshiped? Do you know that whenever you read through the Psalms and read through God's word, you see that people have a demonstrative action when it comes to worship, that their hands are in the air, that they dance. Do you know that King David tore his shirt off and wove it, you know, swung it around like a helicopter? And that his wife was like, what are you doing? He's like, hang on, baby. It's about to get crazy up in here. Can I, can I tell you, listen, can I tell you the thing that concerns me, and I always push on this, because this has been a church that has an incredible high view of God's word, but the thing that keeps you in the lobby when the music starts isn't because the mu music's loud. It's that thing that means I'm going to be stiff because I don't want to look uncomfortable and out of place. But you're missing the presence of God. You're missing the opportunity to understand God differently. You're missing the opportunity to see God differently. You're missing the opportunity to hear from God differently. Here, here's what I'm trying to say to you. Be careful to not miss the miracle for the sake of being comfortable. Now, look, I've been gone three weeks, so I know that you're a little out of practice. That's a really good spot for an amen. <laughs> Be careful. Be careful to not miss the miracle, to not... Be careful that you don't miss the power and the presence of God because, because you're afraid to be uncomfortable. Because God will regularly push you into things you don't understand to teach you something that you would never otherwise know about him. Look at what Sarah says. The Lord, he shows up to Abram and Sarah's house, Abraham and Sarah's house, and he says, here's the deal. I know you've been waiting, so surely I'm going to return to you about this time next year, and I'm going to do my thing. All right? I'm going to do my thing. Y'all are going to have a kid. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Okay? So picture it. This is like the tent wall, and Sarah's got like a Dixie cup up against the tent. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And God's talking. You would be doing that, too, if God were in your living room. And Abram, now Abram and Sarah were old. And just in case you don't know what that means, that means they were advanced in years. All right? Do you, can you imagine that if for all of eternity, the thing that was connected to your story is that you were old, right? Congratulations, Sarah, you're old. And the way, he goes further, the way of women had ceased to be, look at it, she was old, she was advanced in age, and the way of women had ceased to be with her. We get it, okay? We get it. And she's listening, and she hears God say this, and look at what happens. So Sarah laughed to herself, and this isn't like, ha, 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 ha. This is like, pfft, pfft, pfft. Come on. Are you kidding me? Come on, somebody up in here with you crazy. Sarah, come on, somebody, God, okay? Saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said, <laughs> don't make it weird. Don't make it weird. <laughs> Someone's like, Hoo -hoo -hoo. stop it. The Lord said to Abraham, check it out. Why did Sarah laugh? Now, now, I... 
I just, I love the Bible. So here's Sarah. Pfft. What, 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 what? She's laughing. That's the dumbest thing I've, what? God calls Sarah out. Listen, you don't, you don't want, have you ever been talking about God and you didn't know he was listening? He's like, what? What'd you say? What? Nothing. <laughs> Why did she laugh? Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Here it is. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Do you know when God gets offended? When you tell him he can't do something. Is anything too hard for me? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and I'm going to do what I said. Sarah will have a son. Believe God even when it's unbelievable. Believe God even when it takes a long time. Believe God when those around you don't believe God. Listen, do you really think that the enemy is not wise enough to put people around you who invest doubt and cynicism into your heart? And I want to talk to you, especially if you're on social media and especially if you're of the age where that's an important thing for you. Listen, I'm on social media. I've got no beef with it. Here's what you do need to understand, though, that you're inviting voices into your life that haven't earned the right to speak. You're inviting perspectives. You're inviting relationships that aren't really relationships. They're just opinions. And you got to be careful that sometimes you're listening to people that you shouldn't be listening to at the expense of what God's trying to do. And so I want you to be careful, young person, about who you surround yourself with. You show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. And so there are going to be times where God's going to be speaking, and you got to understand that whenever God speaks, the enemy works. And one of the ways that the enemy works as you're trying to believe God is he brings people around who tells you why it's dumb for you to believe, why you ought to give up, why you ought to just cash it in, why you ought to not pay attention. So look at what Sarah says. She says, God has made laughter for me, and there's coming a day, come on somebody, who are, everyone will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abram that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. I want you to jot this down. This is an important thing. Let your critics see your fruit, not hear your response. Listen, you're always going to have critics if you're seeking to walk with God. That's the nature of spiritual warfare. It's the simplest nature of spiritual warfare. That God is at work, and so the enemy is at work. But instead of you getting bogged down on social media, responding to all your haters, why don't you just live your life and following God and let the fruit speak for itself? Imagine all those people who had said that Sarah was goofy for believing God. Said, you're never going to have a baby. What if they came to the hospital and Sarah's like, what now? What are you going to call them? I'm going to call them, you were wrong. What you got? Can I tell you, it's not only for you, but it's for us. It's for this church. Listen, you, well, if God's at work, you're always going to have critics. You're always going to have people who say it's not the right way, it's not the right thing, you're not saying it right, you're not doing it right, you're having too much fun, you look like it's not serious enough. Here's what I want to say. Let God save people, let people be baptized, let families be restored and lives be healed, let that fruit for, speak for itself. And frankly, my dear... I don't care. Be about the work that God has in your life. Let the fruit stand on itself. Let your response stay behind your teeth and let God get the glory. Amen? Amen. 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 It's important. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And so Sarah, Sarah says, listen, believe God even when it takes a long time. Believe God when it's unbelievable. Believe God when other people don't. And there's always going to be people who don't. But don't complicate the promises of God. Number two, she would say, hey, don't, don't get ahead of God. Don't get ahead of God when he's not moving fast enough. I, uh, I'm not what you would consider or maybe a great example uh, of a patient person. I'm just not. Uh, it's actually... Part of it is just my temperament and part of it is my gifting and part of it is my brokenness. And, you know, my wife is fighting a, a hearty amen right now. Um, I, I just, I'm bent to get stuff done. I'm bent to the side. I'm, I'm fast. I'm, uh, I'm all those things. Um, and I'm prone to get ahead. I can get ahead of God. Do you know our culture is also, uh, it's not a patient culture, right? I mean, have you ever been on your phone and you're like, uh, hey, Siri, where is, and Siri takes like 14 seconds. You're like, what's the deal? Hey, it's coming from outer space, okay? <laughs> calm down. C 
calm down. Am I on 3G? This is ridiculous. <laughs> How about you go to a restaurant and you order, hey, uh, yeah, I'll take a cheeseburger and some fries. Yeah, cool. And like 15 minutes later, you're like, hey, you didn't breed that cow. You didn't slaughter that cow, right? You didn't butcher that cow. You're not cooking that cow. You didn't plant those potatoes. You're not frying them up, okay? Decaf, calm down. Hey, can I give you one more? Uh, sir, I, I'm sorry to tell you this, your flight is delayed. Pfft, my flight's delayed? What am I gonna do? Oh, I don't know, drive 48 hours compared to the three hour flight you were gonna take? You're gonna get in a tin can, go 30,000 feet in the air and 10,000 miles an hour, you can wait an hour, right? But we're just like panicked. If we have to wait, and listen, we bring this into the church, don't we? And, and here's how this looks. We uh, don't understand why God would take a long time when he could just do it now. Hey, God, you, like, you own the cattle on a thousand hills and all that other stuff. Like, you could do this right now. What's the holdup? And so I want you to see what, uh, what the Bible says. It says that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, and I love this, as some of y'all count slowness. It's like God says, I know you're having a hard time waiting for this, uh, but I'm not slow. In fact, I'm patient towards you. You're not patient toward me, but I am being patient towards you. I need you to understand that God is not concerned about being fast. He is concerned about being on time. Amen? Amen. God's not concerned about uh, about how quickly he can get it done, he's concerned about it being at the right time and the right way for his glory and your joy. So the Bible goes on and it says, you know, there are gonna be times where you're gonna have to wait and in order for you to wait well, here's what you need to do. You need to be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret yourself over the one who prospers or disagrees or says it's not the right way or over the man who carries out evil devices. I wanna, I wanna challenge you if you're in a season of waiting to just take 10 minutes. I don't, I'm not even telling you to read your Bible. I'm not even telling you to pray. I'm just telling you to put on worship music at whatever, whoever you like to listen to, and just be still before God. And just worship God while you wait. And just be still, and just let God speak, and say no matter what you provide, you're still the highest, and the greatest, and the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And I'll tell you that in order to wait patiently, you have to learn to be still. But if you won't learn to be still, you're not gonna be able to wait patiently. And so the Bible and probably Sarah say, listen, don't, don't get ahead of God. Don't get ahead of, of what he's trying to do. Don't get ahead of where he's trying to go. And a lot of times I need to just put in front of you, we think that the damage created by not waiting is greater than the damage of waiting. It's, it's, it's actually called FOMO, fear of missing out. Like, if I don't do something now, I'm gonna miss, no. I'm gonna trust that God is capable of bringing the right thing to me at the right time in the right way for, for him to receive glory. It's a powerful thing. But in order, I, I promise you, if you'll take just this week, those 10 minutes, I promise you, your heart rate will come down. I promise you, you'll learn to be still, but you're gonna have to practice you're gonna to have to practice being still before him. And so Sarah says, listen, you're gonna to have to believe God and don't get ahead of him. And then as you're waiting, focus on what is happening in you, not what is happening to you. Focus on what is happening in you, not what is happening to you. So I want you to think about it this way. Uh, worship needs a replacement. It, it's not like, I don't wanna do, do this anymore, so I'm just gonna grit. No, you gotta find something greater. You gotta find something more worthy of worship. And so this is the reason that every Sunday we come in and we say, you are the highest and you are the greatest and you are the most worthy because we're reminding our hearts that the reason that we worship God is there's nothing greater than him. There's nothing to replace him with. Patience is the same. Imagine that you're having to wait for something and this is what most of us do. Here's our version of waiting. Right? We just stare at it. Did, it. did you see that? No? Okay. And the enemy comes along while we watch it and wait and says, 
why would God do this to you? Why God? Here's what you need to understand. That anytime something's happening to you, it's because God's wanting to do something in you. And so we say, God, look, man, I need you to provide. And over here, God's saying, I'm trying, I'm trying to restore your heart and make you generous. God, I need you to speak. God, I need you to do. I'm trying to teach you how to pray, son. God, my spouse, would you please do something about my spouse? You want me to walk over there? <laughs> Maybe. Instead of staring at her, you should see that God's trying to do something in you. Maybe your obedience will open up the faith for her to experience the change that you're waiting for God to do in her instead of thinking that maybe he's wanting to do it in you. This is a powerful, powerful thing. Look at what the Bible says, Romans chapter 8. Now hope that is seen, it ain't hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, this is God's grace, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In other words, this thing of, I'm not just going to stare at it, I'm going to be open to the possibility that God's trying to do something in me. I don't, that's painful. God says, I know. That's why I'm sending my spirit. I know. That's why I'm going to be with you. I know. That's why I'm going to be present. I know. You can't see how me growing you is going to help this, but I can see it, and so I'm going to send my spirit to encourage you in the meantime. Maybe the reason that you're waiting is because God's waiting for you to consider that it's not about that, it's about me. Maybe the reason that it keeps happening isn't because you're a magnet for bad luck. It's because God's continuing to try to put a mirror in front of you with circumstance to say, sis, hey, I want to set you free from this. Hey, I want to restore this in you. Hey, I want to grow this in you. And you're listening to the enemy who's saying that I'm trying to do something to you. I'm trying to do something for you. I'm trying to do something in you so that I can do something through you. And if you would just wait and be still and listen, I can change you. I can change you. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know, I love that, you know this. And you know this. You know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Man, I hate that. I know, but you know that. And so here's what the Bible says. Let steadfastness have its full effect. God, I don't want to be in this one minute past what I absolutely have to be, but I don't want to be in it one minute shy either. So for as long as you have me here, I want to milk what you have for me so that this experience can have its full effect, that you can get the most glory, that I can be the most changed. Because of this, I'm going to let steadfastness have its full effect, that I could be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God doesn't do stuff to you. God does stuff in you and for you. And in a culture that is so immediate, some of the ways that God does is just to tap the brakes a little bit. Hey, Bubba, you're about to make a mistake. I need you to slow down. I need you to listen to me. I need you to worship me. I need you to trust me. I need you to not complicate this with your ideas. Count it all joy. And then here's the last. I think that, I think that Sarah uh, would have got a little twinkle in her eyes and a big smile on her face when she said this. Uh, our very best does not compare to what God has in mind. Look at the book of Isaiah. From, from of old, in other words, all the way back, ain't nobody ever heard or perceived by ear or eye a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. I want, I want you to just picture you walk into that delivery room and Sarah I mean, she's old, but man, she's glowing, and she's all sweaty, and the docs are around her, and hey, how'd it go? Man, I bet you the first thing out of her mouth would have been about the promise of God, not baby Isaac. Can you believe? I mean, 10 fingers, 
and ten toes, and he's healthy. Dude, like, it's like God knew all along. It's like God had this planned all along, and he's beautiful. You know, we have three kids, and uh, we had prayed that God would give us kids, and we had a couple miscarriages, and that was a painful thing. And so we found out that we were pregnant with what is now Noah, and, uh, and, and my wife had a terrible pregnancy. My, you know how they say, like, you're just going to be sick in the first trimester. Nope. My, six, my wife is sick for nine months, all right, and just feeling terrible and worn out, and it was, it was a hard pregnancy. Uh, but do you know, as soon as she saw what is now Noah, it I mean, I felt, I didn't think that I knew that I could love something on the spot with every molecule of my being, right? And I fell in love with that boy immediately. And then we found out we were pregnant again, and my wife had another terrible pregnancy. And I thought to myself, how am I going to love this second baby with his big old head, right? <laughs> he got it honest. How am I going to love, and now it's a girl, oh man, and my wife had a terrible pregnancy, and then that, my, my little prince, my hippie princess, Emma, came out. And I thought, I'm going to love you with every molecule of my being. And what are you looking at? I'll cut you. <laughs> right? Don't you ever say anything about. And then, then we got pregnant again. And Isaiah, and Isaiah is full of life. And you do, God just enlarges your heart on the spot. And it's always amazing to me that, that women, we go, you go through these terrible months. And God, just let me help you. You don't understand. Okay, there's not an illustration, there's not a compare. Yeah, I know that time that the Indians lost, that was it. Just shut up, all right? <laughs> when LeBron left the second time, I felt like I was going through labor. No, you didn't, okay? <laughs> but it's amazing to me to go through this terrible process, and then a couple, a couple months after it, it's like, I think I want another one. <laughs> Are you crazy? Why would you possibly want another one? Because you see what God formed in you through the labor and the pain. Because you can hold it, because you can touch it, because you can feel it. And that nine months, 10 months of waiting, the morning sickness, you look at what God has created through it. And you say, this was worth all of it. And so I think that Sarah would stand up and she would say, Baby, I know you're hurting. I know it's taking a long time. But trust me when I tell you, God's forming something in you that you're not going to want to miss. And when you get to hold it, and when you get to see it, trust me when I tell you that you're going to be glad you went through it. But until then, take God at his word. Until then, don't get ahead of him. Until then, work on what's happening in you. And until then, be believing that when you hold that baby, you do it all again. Amen? Yeah. All right, why don't you stand up? We got three baptisms, y'all, we're going to do here today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Miss Jenny play over that. These are folks who uh, are declaring that God has saved them declaring that God is good and kind and faithful, that their life is never going to be the same. And so we baptize them, and here's what we say. I bury you in the likeness of Jesus' death, and I raise you again in newness of life. And so the opportunity that you have is to say yes and celebrate it with them. So watch with me. Yeah. Let me help you out. 
two months ago, that last little boy's mama stood up at the end of a service and said she needed to go get baptized, right? And so now, that's the goodness of God, y'all. That's incredible. Hey, listen, we got growth track step two happening today. Growth track, if you're a guest, is our way to help you step into all that God has for you. And so it's at noon. I'm going to be teaching it on the other side of that wall. We'll feed you. We'll watch your kids. Step two, if you haven't done it, please make sure that you get over there and do that. We are doing first Sunday on the second Sunday, which is tonight at six o'clock. So it's second Sunday, just one time. We've had a ton of people ask that we do some teaching on how does God go about saving people? Does he choose people? Do people choose him? How does that all work? And so we're going to unpack that tonight with a lot of questions and do a time of the Lord's Supper. You don't want to miss that six o'clock tonight. And then ministry school is happening. We are launching ministry school August 23rd. It's a Thursday night from 6.30 to 9.30. Ministry school is for those of you who feel like God has a ministry for you to step into. Anyone? Anyone? Hopefully everybody has that. So that's why it's not called missionary school. That's why it's not called pastor school. That's why it's not called church planner school. Will we have training for that? Yes, we will. But this is for those of you who say, I need more training. I need more clarity. I need more support around the ministry that God has for me. If you're interested in that, go out to the Next Steps desk, and they will give you information, even help you get signed up. I'm going to be teaching that. Pastor Jeff's going to be teaching that. Pastor John's going to be teaching that in the first semester. It's going to be awesome. And so whenever I travel in the future, here's what I would love to see. Graceway Clearwater Beach, come on, right? Uh-huh, any takers on that? Graceway St. Augustine, Graceway Orlando, because we got people who are saying, I think God's wanting me to plant a church. I think God wants me to be a campus pastor. I think that God might, whatever that might be, we wanna be a part of it, amen? So go out and check that out. Let me pray for you and we'll be dismissed. God, I thank you for the life of Sarah, for her wisdom, for her strength, for her faith, for her weakness, for her failure. God, Sarah in so many ways is us, and Sarah in so many ways points us to Jesus and the need for strength and renewal and grace. And so, God, we come to you today, and we say we need you to be near to us. We need you to speak, maybe at a little higher volume or a little closer. But, God, we want to endure. We want steadfastness to take its full effect. We want, God, to wait for what you have for us because we believe that it's beautiful, because we believe that it's worth it, because we believe that you always complete what you started. And so for those of us who are weary, would you strengthen us? For those of us who are afraid, would you steady us? For those of us who are distant, would you bring us closer? And would you be at work in our lives and in our church for your glory and for our joy? We love you, God, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus and all his people said, amen, amen and amen. I love you. Have a great week. Hey, Pastor Tim here. I hope that you enjoyed our service. If it was a blessing to you or God spoke to you, I hope that you'll let us know. Shoot us an email at amen at visitgraceway.org. We would love to hear what God's doing in your life and how we might be able to help you in it. If you'd like to support our ministry, you can support us by giving right there. And if you live in the Kansas City area, I hope that you'll stop by and give us a visit. We'd love to shake your hand, buy you a cup of coffee, worship Jesus together. Let us know how we can be of help to you, and I hope to see you soon.